This is All India Radio. In the program Spotlight, now we bring you a discussion on India-Australia relations in view of Australian Prime Minister's visit to India. The participants are Professor Harsh V. Pant, Strategic Analyst, and S. Rangabhashim, AIR Correspondent. The Australian Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is on a four-day visit to India. And uh, during this visit, there will be lots of discussions and bilateral meetings on uh, business issues. And also the comprehensive strategic partnership will be in sharp focus. Both the leaders, our Prime Minister and the Australian Prime Minister, are expected to hold talks on trade, investment, defense, education and renewable energy. To discuss uh, this, we have with us our expert, Harsh V. Panth. Mr. Panth, a warm welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Today, the Australian Prime Minister you know, kicked off his visit uh, with cricket di- diplomacy and watching a, a cricket match between uh, the Indian and Australian team in Ahmedabad. Moving ahead, can we expect uh, you know, real outcomes as far as the bilateral strategic uh, relationship is concerned? Uh, yes, that's absolutely. You know, cricket in some ways has been symbolic of India-Australia relationship, both underscoring the times, the convergence between the two countries, as well as the limits of that partnership. In the past, it used to be said that India-Australia partnership is driven by three Cs, cricket, curry and commonwealth. Uh, I think we are now moving to a position where uh, these older paradigm is giving uh, way to a newer paradigm where perhaps three new Cs can be seen as important, uh, China, climate and uh, critical technologies. So I would say that there has been a fundamental transformation of the relationship in the last decade and a half and successive governments in India, successive governments in Australia in particular because there have been a number of prime ministers over the last few years in in Australia but all of them have been committed to a strong India-Australia partnership. And in India and the Prime Minister Modi, we have seen a lot of momentum, a lot of attention being given to India-Australia relationship. So overall, uh, this has been a relationship which has become much more substantive. So while the cricket aspect, the cricket diplomacy aspect of today is symbolic of this relationship, I think uh, the substance of this relationship uh, is is moving in a direction which cannot be ignored. And that substantive engagement, whether it is on defense, security, whether it is on economic and trade, or whether it is on climate change and critical technologies, that is something that we will witness uh, during this visit of Prime Minister Albanese. Uh, Mr. Pant, uh, uh, last year India and Australia signed the you know, economic cooperation and trade agreement, ECTA, in April and it was subsequently after ratification actually came into implementation in the end of uh, uh, December last year. So we are just into, you know, two months, roughly two months into the agreement. Can we expect, you know, faster implementation of the economic cooperation and trade agreement which involves uh, lots of uh, issues related to export and import? Uh, yes, I think we are going to see economy, of course, uh, the focus of uh, India-Australia relationship going forward. Uh, and uh, in particular, uh, during this visit, we have with Prime Minister of Australia a huge trade delegation that is uh, visiting India. Uh, and the attempt is to operationalize the free trade pact that you mentioned uh, to make it more productive and to ensure that uh, the message goes out both from Canberra and from New Delhi to the Australian corporate sector that India means business, that it is in the interest of Australian corporate sector to look at India as a productive, not only productive market, but also a productive invest- investment destination. And uh, that, uh, that, you know, that older a framework where India was seen as relatively protectionist has given way now to an India that is more confident of engaging with like-minded countries on trade and, and technology. And that means that uh, as uh, Australia tries to reduce its dependence on China as it attempts to diversify its trading and investment partners, the Australian corporate sector needs to relook at India through a lens that they have not done in the past. Australian corporate sector has traditionally been very risk-averse uh, and they have not really taken advantage of India and the returns that India gives to its investors. And now is the right moment at a time when India is perhaps the fastest growing major economy in the world, when India has political stability, when India is willing to enter into free trade agreements, unlike in the past. This is the time when, when Australian corporate sector needs to double down on India. And that's the reason why we are going to see a lot of focus on trade and investment in this uh, during this visit, but also going forward, uh, because this is an area which has not performed on par with the expectations that perhaps uh, the political leaderships in the two countries had. And so uh, while uh, defense and security ties have boomed, economic ties have been, un- have been underwhelming to a certain extent. But we are going to see that change in the coming years. 
I also want to, you know, bring in this point about uh, the DTA, that is the Double Taxation Avoidance uh, Agreement. There are certain uh, provisions because of which, you know, uh, the Australian government is not able to levy taxes on royalties, fees and other kinds of receipts of Indian companies there. Do you think, you know, some kind of tinkering is needed uh, as far as this uh, Double Taxation Avoidance Agreement is concerned so that it becomes more lucrative for Indian companies uh, to operate uh, from Australia? Uh, well, I think there has been one area of discussion between the two governments and, and how do you comfortable Indian companies are in operating in an, in an Australian environment with the double taxation provision. Uh, now, uh, some of the movement, I think once the, uh, the trade agreement was finalized and it was ratified, and this is, I think, the second stage where there is a lot of push now from India to, to see whether this can be uh, actioned upon, whether there can be a movement where the issue of double taxation can be resolved in a manner that perhaps allows India and companies to take full advantage and then I'm sure that that is going to be an area which is uh, two sides will be looking at but what is I think important is that in a short period of three to four years we have seen change of mindset between the two countries that they need to really look very carefully at provisions at specific provisions and at the larger picture of how they engage with each other on uh, on economic matters because it's now a question that this is perhaps the time which cannot be really ignored this is a time when the two nations, when the two corporate sectors and the two entities, when the entities in two countries that want to engage each, with each other on trade and, and economic matters, they need to be very, very uh, cognizant of the fact that as global geopolitics is changing and as it is driving geoeconomics, trust-based partnerships are going to be vital in trade and uh, economic relationships. And between Australia and India today, the trust level is very, very high, which allows for the possibility of not only the big agreements being uh, accepted and ratified, but also if there are any lacuna in the, in the provisions like the double taxation that can also be resolved in a specific manner. Mr. Pant, you follow international relations uh, so closely. I want to bring in this point that India and Australia share warm and friendly relations, both the countries and also the chemistry between the two leaders, the Australian Prime Minister and Prime Minister Narendra Modi matters a lot and the stature of the country and also of our Prime Minister as a world leader today, that also matters a lot, isn't it? Absolutely. I think this is uh, today Prime Minister Modi is seen as one of the few leaders who enjoys enormous political capital, not only at home, uh, but uh, in various parts of the world. He is seen as the leader who has enormous support at home. That gives him that uh, strength to propel his diplomacy in an orbit which very few other leaders are able to do today. So uh, even when we are looking at the crisis in Ukraine, where there are differences between India and some of its partners in the Indo-Pacific like Japan, which have taken a very strong anti-Russia position, or Australia, which has taken a strong anti-Russia position. He is able to work with these partners and take the relationships forward despite differences because many feel that India is the only country that has been able to have access to various interlocutors even in this conflict like Ukraine. So I think there are enormous expectations from the Indian Prime Minister, Indian leadership. There are enormous expectations that this is the leader who can deliver on Indian commitments and I think that makes a difference when you are looking at international relations. Most political leaders today look at Mr. Modi and they believe that his strong leadership is capable of driving India's a global agenda, India's agenda, and again, whether on economy, whether on politics, whether on security, uh, that gives them enough confidence to engage with India as a reliable interlocutor. So that therefore, you know, when we were talking about economic matters earlier, there was always in the past diffidence about India, that India will never be able to deliver on trade. But look how quickly we have been able to deliver on a number of free trade agreements with a number of like-minded countries, where India, then under the leadership of Mr. Modi and government, said that we, you know, we are willing to open ourselves up to a select few countries in ways which we have not done in the past because we believe that India has to be an important node in the global economic order that is emerging. And I think that's a message that Prime Minister Modi has conveyed repeatedly, especially since COVID, that India is not closed. Unlike many developed countries, India remains very open. India remains a country that is willing to work with other countries. And I think that has made a lot of, lot of difference in how India and relates with others and how others relate to India. That's right. Uh, Mr. Pant, let's also talk about education. India roughly spends $4 billion every year on education of Indian students in Australia. And now the latest thing in India is 
you know the education sector has been opened up for foreign universities to come up and set up the campuses in the country and Deakin University of Australia would be probably the first foreign university to set up its campus in India and precisely in Ahmedabad can we expect a better terms and condition for indian students who go to australia for studying I think that has already happened in some ways and we are already seeing how the Australian government how Australian institutions are much more sensitive about Indian requirements whether it is visa whether it is funding whether it is the living situation etc and now what is I think interesting in India Australia relationship is that India Australia relationship today is driven as much by the top down political engagement that we were talking about yeah. just before this question about uh, the top elites political leadership etc but it has also become a bottom up engagement where a large part of indian middle classes today view australia as a viable education destination so many of our best and the brightest are now going to australia to study and uh, they come some of them are of course decide to stay in australia some of them come back so this relationship has become much more engaged on both sides this energy of the youth has given completely new dynamic and therefore the political elites also view this relationship through a different lens today so education has become a driver it will be a drive uh, as indian middle classes continue to pour money uh, into the education se- sector and as australia continues to attract a lot of indian students also the fact that india today is looking at education sector as one where it wants to skill up that sector so therefore by inviting foreign universities to uh, universities to set up campuses in india uh, as you mentioned deakin deakin is one but there is another australian university that is plan- planning to do that as well so australians have been first of the mark in that sense and that is again an important marker in how australia views india as a reliable sustainable partner how australian education sector views india as a reliable country where they are willing to invest for the future so i think education is certainly going to be a very important driver of this relationship going forward and we will continue to see both countries making adjustments as as australia tries to engage more and more of india's youth more and more of india's students and as india decides to engage australian education sector much more substantively right uh, mr pant uh, let's talk about the automobile sector we all know that you know india is now seriously focusing on electric vehicles and the technology involved is the lithium ion battery australia has a rich source of uh, lithium can india harness the availability of lithium in australia uh, absolutely i think this is something that we will see increasingly happening uh, because australia's economic policy today is primarily to to ensure diversification australia was heavily reliant on china it, it still is heavily reliant on china but we have recently uh, as recently as last week heard australian prime minister making it very apparent publicly that they while they do not see china as a strategic competitor yet but they do see china as a country on whom they have to reduce their over reliance and so this shift away from china means that they have to look at countries like india very very seriously and lithium uh, uh, in the context of evs or other minerals critical minerals critical metals are going to be very very important in terms of the relationship that india and australia are going to create for themselves now the other aspect here is of course the larger issue that india as india moves to renewable sector as india moves into into an economy that is driven by emerging technologies climate adaptable technologies uh, where australia is going to be very very important partner so i think if you are looking at the broad or matrix of this relationship both driven by australia's uh, desire to reach out to new partners and to uh, build economic partnerships trade relationships now based on political trust and as you look at india's desire to transform its domestic economic landscape towards a more renewable sector i think uh, the relationship is quite um, is perfect in terms of the blend that the two offer to each other and let's hope uh, that the strategic partnership between india and australia especially in areas like trade investment defense education and renewable energy goes places in times to come mr pants thank you so much for joining us in this program thank you very much You were listening to a discussion on India-Australia relations in view of Australian Prime Minister's visit to India. The participants were Professor Harsh V. Pant, Strategic Analyst, and S. Rangabhasham, AIR Correspondent. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airns.com. 
ddogs at gmail.com.